Danielle Dean and I'm an assistant um, professor at in the visual arts department at UCSD. I'm super excited to introduce artist and researcher Salome Asega. Um, her talk is part of the UCSD um, visual arts department um, speaker series. Um, and so I'm actually personally really excited um, to um, hear about Salome's work because of the work that she does about technology and social practice. Um, so she's based in Brooklyn, New York, and, and Salome has participated in residences and fellowships with iBeam, New Museum, the Laundromat Project, and Recess. And she has exhibited at the Shanghai Biennial, MoMA, Carnegie Library, and many more. She has also given presentations and lectures at many prestigious places, um, including Performer, Brooklyn Museum, MIT Media Lab, NYU, and uh, many more places. Um, Salome is currently a Ford Foundation Technology Fellow, Landscaping New Media Artists and Organization Networks. She is also the Director of Partnerships at Powerplan, a youth digital art collaboratory in Brooklyn. Um, Salome received her MFA from Parsons at the New School in, in Design and Technology, where she also currently teaches. Um, she teaches classes on speculative design and participatory, participatory design methodologies. So please stay tuned after uh, the lecture um, for an extended Q&A moderated by MFA candidate Bailey Davenport. Um, yes, yeah, so please stay and um, ask some great questions. So I'm happy to pass over to Salome now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I have a, a some past projects I want to talk about, something I'm currently working on. I'll talk about Power Plant, which was mentioned in my bio. Um, and then I'll also maybe end with some frameworks and some things to read, um, some texts that have influenced uh, my thinking and my projects. So I will just get into it. I will share my screen. All right, so I think you should be able to see that. Um, again, my name is Salome, my pronouns are she, her. Um, so this is a project uh, I started in 2014 called Crown Heights Mike. It's a collaboratively built pirate radio station based in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. The transmitter runs on the FM dial and has about a half a mile radius. Local residents and business owners could sign up for a time slot and I would pass off this little radio setup from DJ to DJ. And the only rule was that you had to do your show in Crown Heights. What I love about this project is the FM transmitter is really just a tool and the project is, is driven by the people who participate. This is Fahid. He owns a general store in the neighborhood and he would get so into the project that he started advertising his sets in front of his general store. My love for radio later grew into me working with Houston, Texas based uh, artist collective Otabanga Jones and Associates on a project um, called OJBK FM, which was commissioned by Creative Time and Weeksville. Um, I outfitted this beautiful cotton candy pink Cadillac with a web radio server, and we hosted shows in Bed Stuy, Brooklyn, where I'm based now, and in Third Ward, Houston. Our shows ranged from hyperlocal Black history lessons to DJ sets and live performances. Um, we collected and documented the kind of regional and hyperlocalized Black history you can't really find in school textbooks. And it made truly, it made public radio truly public. People from off the street would walk up, ask what we were doing, get on the mic, and immediately be on air. This is another project called Level Up. It's a game that teaches you how to do the real Harlem Shake using Connect. So in the summer of 2012, DJ Bauer came out with a song called um, Harlem Shake, which prompted people to make viral videos like these. And while this might look fun, videos of the real Harlem Shake 
dance sort of got lost on the internet. You'd have to go pages and pages into YouTube search before you were able to find the original dance form. So through a residency at New Museum, I worked with curator and dancer Ali Rosa Salas and um, Light Feet Nation founder Crybaby Cozy and a whole slew of Light Feet dancers um, to develop this game. Light Feet dancers, um, if you've been to New York, you maybe see them on the subway. Um, they're like the last keepers of this dance form. So we map the dancer's shoulder movements using Connect and this game kind of happened at um, a peak time in Connect where artists and technologists were learning that they could hack Connect and um, develop their own games. So I was kind of part of this, this phase of open source um, game creation and um, art making with Connect. So we mapped the, uh, the sh dancer shoulder move movements and used it as data for the game. And um, you can see here us just like playing around and um, trying to capture the dancers. This is an install shot of the game at Trial Amsterdam. You push this big red, red uh, inviting button on the left, which launches a minute long instructional round with Crybaby Cozy, where he teaches you the fundamentals of the Harlem Shake. So here you're, you're learning what to do with your shoulders, you're learning what to do with your hands, you're learning what to do with your feet, you're le learning footwork. Um, and then you're also learning a little attitude. He's like such a great uh, educator and like he gives you such a good introduction to not only the dance, but the culture. There he is, Crybaby Cozy. So after um, the intro round, you go into a battle round against one of the dancers. And you know, I've seen this game installed in several places. And to be honest, <laughs> I don't think I've seen many people win, um, but it is really playful to, um, to see people move in a way you're you're not generally taught to move in you know in exhibition spaces or you know places where you're not supposed to touch things here are people dancing and moving and meeting new people so my interest uh research interests are rooted in how cultural art and artifacts are recorded preserved and celebrated so i want to talk about uh one main project, but before I do, we should talk a little bit about the history of sharing African diasporic art and culture. Before institutions collected and shared objects, they were exhibiting people. This is Oda Benga, a Congolese man who was seized by slave traders in the early 1900s to be exhibited in the St. Louis World Fair, and then was later sold to explorer Samuel Phillips Werner to be exhibited in the Bronx Zoo's Monkey House. Even earlier, there was Sarji Bartman, one of two South African women who were exhibited as freak show attractions across Europe under the name Hot and Top Venus. And even when we talk about African diasporic objects or artifacts, many of our museums have robust collections, but the credit line is usually a nod to how the object was acquired, which again points to a story of seizure. So, you know, when you enter many encyclopedic museums that have um, Africa collections um, and you want to know like, well, who specifically made this work, it's nearly impossible to do so. At most, you would get a um, name of a specific tribe within a country and uh, the credit line, as you see here, is to who owns the work, who bought the work, who acquired the work. And when we zoom out even farther to how contemporary culture is represented and shared, a similar narrative of seizure and erasure exists. Um, I'm gonna leave it here with, <laughs> with Katy Perry. Um, so all of these constitute serious issues of black artistic and cultural representation. As a way to address these issues, another artist, Ayo Demola Okunsende and I came together to start the IAPO repository through a residency with IBEAM here in New York. So IAPO repository is a resource library that exists in a nondescript future and houses a collection of art and artifacts made by and for people of African descent. There are many entry points and various influences for um, this project. We're thinking about the rising number of e-waste sites on the continent and how folks are able to turn trash into working material. This is Fabrice Montero, a Senegalese artist who uses e-waste sites to make these 
beautifully delicate scenes and he photographs them at large scales. There's also Calvin Doe, AKA DJ Focus, who at the age of 13 used e-waste to build his own pirate radio station in Sierra Leone. His story went viral and I think he became um, one of the youngest MIT media fellows. Uh, we're also influenced by a whole slew of Afrofuturist films coming um, out of the continent. This is Pumzi, a Kenyan film by Wanuri Kawi that explores the intersection of race and environmental devastation and climate change. Um, this film, I believe, is free online um, on Vimeo. It's a short film. Um, there's also Crumbs, the film by Spanish filmmaker Miguel Lanzo and is Ethiopia's first post-apocalyptic post love story. It's um, so, so beautiful. The colors are great and it just moves slow, so slowly. Um, I love Hype Williams. Uh, Belly is uh, Hype Williams' first feature length film, also available online for free on YouTube, the entire film. Um, the film features a whole group of uh, rappers from this era, including Nas and DMX. Um, the opening credits are the most important to me. So if anything, please watch the first five minutes. Here are some more Hype Williams stills. Uh, we're also influenced by the now retro future aesthetics of early uh, music public access TV shows that were popping up in the late 80s and early 90s in cities like Detroit, Chicago, Memphis, and Atlanta. This is the new dance show, which comes out of Detroit. Also, many of the episodes are available online for free on YouTube. Uh, so uh, people always ask, where does the name come from? Uh, Iapo repository uh, pays homage to Lilith Iapo, Iapo, who's a central figure in Z Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis trilogy. She is uh, the last human being that resembles people of our kind. So, um, you know, continuing with an institutional fiction, we name our space after a person and we've chosen her. Uh, so the repository has four main divisions, which all require a level of participation to create. We host a series of workshops to generate the artifacts that end up in our collection. So we ask participants uh, to become archivists of the Opera repository and ask them to invent future artifacts through this card game. So if uh, there's a narrative card which um, reflects a kind of future direction in which you're designing for, so you have revolutionary, you have apocalyptic, utopian, dystopian, many more words. You, there's a domain card which describes um, the field in which you're designing for. So here you have politics, but we also have like health, environment, uh, education. Um, and lastly, you're given an object card which describes some physical quality your artifact must have. So here we have changes color. Um, there's also things like spherical, it lights up, it has a motor. Um, so given this, this just provides a little bit of a parameter for you to think about the future. So if you were given this set of cards, you'd have to come up with a revolutionary political tool that somehow incorporates changing color. Then you draw it on this very official manuscript sheet, which then we encase in acrylic and file away in our manuscript division. So we've hosted public workshops on the street in our neighborhood. Uh, when we've done these on the street activations, Io dresses as an astronaut so we can barter selfies for artifact designs. Uh, we've also partnered with community-driven organizations and universities and museums to host us. It's an, important to me to make unlikely partnerships in our work, to be able to leverage resources and share knowledge between spaces. The following images come from a successful partnership between VIA, uh, which is an art new media festival based in Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon University, and August Wilson Center, a legacy Black institution in Pittsburgh. So through the August Wilson Center lab, we tweaked our workshop curriculum. We've added three tracks, three tracks that make time for exposure and hands-on exploration with new technologies. That way participants are more involved in the making process. 
here are images of, of, of our August Wilson Center lab. So one workshop track asks participants to rapid prototype their artifact designs using basic electronic components, things like microcontrollers, LEDs, buzzers, and servo motors to prototype. We also have a VR engineering track that asks participants to sketch their future artifact in 3D space using Vive and Tilt Brush. This is most of our participants' first time using VR, and it's really an opportunity to just kind of go wild um, and get comfortable with a new tool and also become critical of a new tool. And the third track is digital fabrication, where we show participants how to, how to use a laser cutter or a 3D printer to fabricate some aspect or some component of their future artifact design. So let's get into some examples of artifacts that have come out of our workshops. This is a bodysuit that gives you the calming sensation of being underwater and is a therapeutic uh, tool for treating people with water-related traumas. So this, the participant who drew this was thinking specifically about the transatlantic slave trade experience as maybe being a root trauma for herself and her family um, and potentially many other Black Americans. So we took this sketch after you know, our workshop conversation, took it back to the studio and we tried to build it um, to, become, to be fully realized. So it's fully functioning. So then these finished artifacts sit in our art and artifacts division. So here's a suit fully realized. Um, with some of the artifacts, we make films so you can kind of see them in context. You know, what happens often when you um, exhibit a work in maybe a museum context or gal gallery context is that it becomes very static. So we try to make films so you can see them in motion and just get more, more layers to the work. So here's a film. The films then sit in our, um, Iapo Film Division. So the suit has water pumping around. Um, the limbs and you can hear like the nice, this nice whir of the water moving around you. At each one of the cuff, at, at each one of the joints there are these black cuffs that have vibrator motors embedded in them. And these motors are synced to tidal patterns of the Atlantic Ocean. So you have this really nice undulating uh, vibration along your body. This is Chemo, uh, the person who drew this decided, decided to name it and brand it. So this is Chemo, a device that is, a, that is portable and can also be worn as a necklace. It picks up on negative vibrations and quickly alerts the wearer. So we then had to have a conversation with the participant in the workshop group about, well, how do you quantify and qualify negative vibrations? And so this led us into a conversation about state sanctioned violence um, and policing in the United States. And so we created this necklace that has a GPS module in it that alerts the wearer when they are at an intersection uh, where there's been a, a police involved shooting. Right now, the database is New York City specific because it's um, synced to the Guardian's database of uh, New York specific police involved shootings. These are affirmation pills, a prescribed or maybe even vitamin-like supplement that when taken gives you a specialized Black history lesson. So here we have civil rights, transatlantic slave trade, and rock and roll. So the person who drew this was thinking um, about microaggressions and was like, wouldn't it be great if you could just give someone a pill and they just get your experience, they immediately understand um, what you're going through. 
and this artifact always makes me laugh because I've seen people try to take the pills in in exhibitions. It's, it's as if they fall so deeply into the um, the narrative of the wall text that they think maybe they could learn something if they take <laughs> they take one of these. Um, but what I love about the experience of making this is that the person um, who drew this just kind of like carried in with them whatever they were feeling that day. And it, it tends to hold true for many of the artifacts that um, show up in our collection is that people kind of make the things that they're actively thinking about that day. Um, here's maybe one last artifact I'll share. So you know when you hold up a, a seashell to your ear, you can hear the sound of the ocean. Well, this participant was thinking, well, what if you put up a seashell to your ear and you could hear the contributions made by Black women to music and sound production across diaspora, across time, across history? And so we worked with her to develop this seashell that when placed to your ear, you hear um, this uh, playlist of songs that are made by Black women across diaspora and again, across time that are significant to how music has been changed, you know, that have catalyzed new ways of of making sound. And here's a still from uh, our Iapo film with this artifact. So when we exhibit the project, we include the artifacts, the finished pieces, the sculptures, along with a manus with along with the manuscript division. So all the original drawings from the workshops, um, the descriptions made, you know, written by the person who is designing this artifact. Um, we also include the films, which you can see here, they're projected um, kind of at full scale in the back. We also try to make the space as active as possible. Um, so in the case of the August Wilson Center Lab, we were able to put tables in the middle of the exhibition and kind of leave the cards out for people to continue to add to and contribute to the IAPO repository. There's one last division of the project. It's the rare media division. Um, on the left, you can see it's a dead drop library where a visitor can insert a USB stick into the slot and the dead drop will dump a folder of MP3s, PDFs, image and video files that have influenced the project. Um, we worked with the Black Unicorn Library and Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh to update the design a bit and, and, and also the content for the piece. And that's what you see on the right. There it is installed in the stacks at the Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh. So there people could um, walk up to it, um, tap on these acrylic panels in whatever way they like, it'll light up, and then they're prompted to um, enter their email address and then they get um, special package of all the material that has influenced the project um, co-curated by Yapo Repository and also the Black, uh, Black Unicorn Library. So a couple of reflections about this work. Um, so we've learned a lot of things during this project. Firstly, we've learned that you have to let go a lot when you work collaboratively. Although as artists, we might have had certain visions for the project, the project really gets shaped by who participates, who shows up, and also who doesn't show up. Here's a very sad IO after a first failed attempt to do an on the street workshop. We spent so much time planning the perfect setup and then quickly realized that day of, no one is gonna stop to talk with us about the future uh, during their last minute holiday shopping. This made us think about levels of engagement and how we have to be aware and considerate of what we're asking people to do with us. Uh, what we're really doing is working under an already established legacy of creating self-determined societies. Activists and cultural workers have always been designing systems and tools for the communities, and we shouldn't separate our work because we're playing with emerging technologies. I think both fields of design and um, technology have been so uh, professionalized, right, industrialized to the point where people feel like they need a, de to a degree to be considered a designer, and that's just not true. We've been designing systems for survival forever. And so really just trying to make sure that our work sits under that legacy. Um, we've also learned that most of the ideas coming out of our workshops were about real things happening now. We've collected artifact submissions that were about protecting black people from different aspects of the criminal justice system, from policing to mass incarceration. 
We've collected artifacts that are uh, trying to mitigate the anxieties of our political structures, like creating alternatives to voting booths. We've also had a lot of uh, a lot of artifact submissions that aim to tackle climate devastation. Um, a lot of like wearable uh, farming suits, so people can just grow the food they need to survive on their bodies. Uh, and so we've also thought about maybe rethinking calling our work Afrofuturist because maybe our workshops are simply design thinking or strategy workshops. And the objects we build together are proto prototypes for the alternative and the radical. I was just on a call earlier this morning with another uh, new media artist um, who does a lot of socially engaged art, another black woman. And we were talking about how so much of our work gets tagged as Afrofuturist so quickly. Um, and just how frustrating that can sometimes be because it shouldn't be future, it shouldn't be futurist for black people to be working with technology in the here and now. Um, maybe something we can get into in the Q and A later. So alongside my personal projects, I just quickly wanted to talk about a space where a lot of the learning I've done is put into community practice. My friends, Angelina Dream and Aniba Luque founded Power Plant almost six years ago. Uh, then it was a pop-up digital arts and tech school that floated from little galleries in Bushwick, Brooklyn, then to Red Bull Studios, and then to Hunter College. So really saw it kind of scale up from, um, you know, small art space to then like academic institution. Um, I came in about four years ago and we wanted to start a brick and mortar space, uh, what we call a digital art collaboratory, a space where folks can have unstructured time to use our resources and also sign up for classes. So we found this bright orange beauty salon that had um, like a 2008 Rihanna image on the front, like Rihanna with the red hair. And so we began the work of renovating. I think we did, um, we started with like a $5,000 Kickstarter to buy some of our initial IMAX. Um, most of the materials to build up the space came from uh, a space here in New York called Materials for the Arts, which no longer exists, sadly, uh, but was a giant warehouse where uh, arts and cultural institutions could donate unused materials that then other arts and culture organizations, collectives of people could go in and like shop for free shop for materials. And so all the tiles, a lot of the paint, a lot of like our tables, furniture, all of that came from that space. Um, so here we are, power plant and artist built interest driven school and lab. All the classes in, are pitched and taught by artists and all the classes are selected by what we hear our neighbors say they need and want. And for anyone wondering, Rihanna still is in the building. She is framed and put up in the bathroom. Uh, our classes range from intro to 3D modeling to how to design a logo to camera basics. Our most popular classes are intros to Ableton or CDJs that are taught by local DJs and music producers. We also offer a suite of practical arts training that's become a sort of popular classes like legal basics for artists and how to pitch a project. We also have a monthly residency program where artists working with digital tools can take over the space to host events and ex exhibitions. Um, here are some examples of that. Um, we also partner uh, with cultural and academic institutions around New York City on programming. Here's a collaboration we did with teens in the Parsons Scholars Program at the New School. In just three weeks, they planned an event series that featured an exhibition, a panel on creative entre entrepreneurship for their peers, a rap show, a poetry night, and like a whole bunch of other things that I couldn't even keep up with. They like really made use of the space. And here's a pop-up program we did with Pioneer Works in Brooklyn called Ableton Live Live. We synced all of the computers and routed them through the same mixer so all the workshop participants could build uh, on a collective beat. It's like essentially like an electronic drum circle. And here, like we've embedded um, two local musicians. So they're at once learning. Um, and they're also two, two reps from Ableton, um, the software company themselves. So they're learning at once like the interface from the technologists who like help build the software, right? And they're also learning directly from musicians who use the software in like experimental um, new ways and innovative ways. ways. So I wanna give you a sense of a typical day at Power Plant. 
most of the young people who come in don't aspire to be a graphic designer, artist, filmmaker, fashion designer, because they already identify as such. When I was their age, I would say, when I want to grow up, I want to be, whereas they come in and they come in, come in and say, hi, my name is Salome and I'm an artist and I need you to help me build my website. This is our neighbor, Mega Gamester. He uses our space to build out his game review channel on YouTube. He was recording, editing, and uploading his shows at Power Plant. And just to close, I want to give, I want to share some texts that have propelled my thinking. Um, so, and, and these texts have become foundational to my practice. Um, so here is a snippet from Amiri Baraka's 1969 one-page writing titled Technology and Ethos, where he makes the argument that Political power isn't just a civic engagement, but also a power of imagination and design. Machines are an expression of whomever made them. So in our, in our march towards liberation, Baraka says we must arm ourselves with complete self-knowledge to tip technology, design, and the skills of power towards an ethos that reflects the spirit and imagination of a free Black people. He does this so, so excellently by deconstruct, deconstructing the design of a typewriter and telling us how he would have it he would have designed it himself. Design justice is a de design approach that challenges universalist design prin principles by including and centering the voices that are often erased or overlooked in the design process. There are 10 design justice principles, and I've just pulled out three here, uh, but Sa Sasha Constanza Chalk edited a beautiful book available through MIT Press that catalogs the way this network of practitioners is building a better world and a world where many worlds fit, which I love, the plurality there. The Consentful Tech Project starts with the question, what does consent mean when it comes to our data and our digital lives? They've provided a framework for building technology that is held up by these five pillars of digital consent which are adapted from Planned Parenthood's definition of sexual consent and can easily be remembered by the acronym FRIES. And this is, um, you can find the Consentful Tech Project and all of uh, the, these consent Consentful principles on their website, consentfultech.io. I put it there in the corner, but it might be too small. Um, so, these are uh, two freely available zines and workbooks that prioritize community health and discussions of leg legibility and digital security. These made me think about the ways we can extend the metaphor of glitch to include dark data, which is collected, but unused or uncategorized information that sits in repositories. And lastly, these three books are must must reads. Black women have been at the forefront of discussing the social layers, uh, biases and violences of emerging technologies. With these three books, you'll get an important introduction to algorithmic bias, how digital tools reinforce and deepen inequity and how surveillance is part of a much longer, longer history of policing black people, people of color. Um, the, the tech is new, but the challenges are very old. Um, so with that I will close. Thank you so much, Salome. That was an amazing lecture. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I'm a little worried about my internet connection. Um, that was a fantastic lecture and thank you for joining us today. I just wanna introduce Professor Amy Alexander who's gonna ask the first couple of questions and then we'll open up the Q&A to everybody in the YouTube chat. So make sure you ask your questions. Yes, Salome the Great, that was that was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, oh, I have so many questions, but I'll keep it to two. Um, I, I noticed that uh, particularly with the IAPO repository, there's, um, it, it, there's such a sense of play with it. I, there's, I, there's a lot of, uh, I know there's a lot of efforts towards various maker type of, uh, of spaces and educating the community. And you've kind of brought that, the, the power plant idea into an art making practice, but also combined it with 
uh, a sense of, of playfulness that seems to work really nicely against um, what you talked about, the, the professionalism, the idea that, oh, I'm not a professional, so I can't possibly do this thing that excludes a lot of people, I think, from getting into practices they're not familiar with. I wonder if you can just sort of talk about how you think about play in your practice? Yeah, I think for for me, when I think about like having a design, um, design or technology background, um, I, it's important to me to kind of like lift up small examples of of how I design in my everyday, right? So the example I always like to give is, um, you know, how many of our moms, like when we would go shopping, would keep the plastic bags to then reuse as um, in our trash bins, right? That is designing an internal system for our home. That is designing, right? Like no one needed a degree to do that. And so, and that can scale up, right? And that's a design system that has um, considered sustainability, right? So already is like, so exciting and so to, to unpack in so many ways. But um, yeah, I think for me, it's like, how do I lift up firstly, like the small examples of us doing this work of being inventive and designers in the everyday. And then um, once people feel like comfortable in like assuming that role, right? Like there's been some trust built, like we can move into like collect doing this work together of, um, imagining a new world, right? Imagining future objects, um, whether it's a repository or, you know, in the case of power plant, it's like rethinking how some of these um, roles, roles and fields should work. A lot of people who come into our space, young people who come into our space at power plant, um, like I said, like identify already as artists or fashion designers, right? But they also want to rethink what that field should look like. And we can do that work together there. Great. Um, and um, yeah, it was great you brought up uh, algorithmic bias and uh, Sophia Noble's uh, work. Uh, several of us were just uh, talking about that in a earlier um, discussion and, and how that relates to race and whether there's, um, you know, whether there's a Jim Crow of, of code and, and, you know, what to do about it. And so one of the things that, that came up was that a lot of these algorithms, the machine learning algorithms are built on crowdsourced data and that crowdsourced data is coming from the internet. So if, if society is basically building racist structures and putting racist data on the internet, that gets perpetuated and, and amplified. And, and so that's, you know, that, that's the problem. Um, and you're kind of talking about like, yeah, people need to redesign their, their, you know, people need to design their own systems. And that makes a lot of sense. So how do we do that when we're, you know, we seem to still be at the mercy of this larger racist structure that's feeding, uh, that's feeding, feeding the algorithms. In this case, the data is, is feeding the algorithms. What, what would that look like? How would you build an anti-racist search algorithm, for example? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I feel like um, there are like so many levels to kind of like doing this like public interest technology work, right? Like one is um, thinking about uh, digital equity when it comes to access, right? Like that's kind of like where most people I feel like enter is like knowing that not everyone has access to the internet or digital tools. And so that feels like a very easy way to kind of like, let's ensure that um, people have access, especially now under COVID, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, we're seeing this play out in real time where many of our schools have gone remote and we're learning that not every student has access to internet at home and we're seeing school age children elementary school kids like parked in parking lots of stores of fast food restaurants trying to access the internet to to see their teachers um that is a digital equity issue right and so once that kind of challenge is identified and people know okay like how do we address that i feel like the next issue then is like inclusion, right? Then once you're once people have access to the tools, then then you realize, and I think this is Amy, what you're talking about is that 
this doesn't work for everyone. Now that I have access, this isn't made for me in, in mind, right? And so from there, I, I want to make one of those memes that's like a, you've seen the memes of like the person, the brain is like glowing, like uh, it gets bigger and bigger as they realize the issue, <laughs> that, uh, so, uh, how deep a social issue goes. But like, once you get past inclusion, you realize like, wait, we maybe we should abolish some of these things so they're not working for everyone, right? In the case of facial recognition, um, wasn't made with darker skin tones in mind. And we're seeing in real time, the way that uh, these technologies are policing people and surveilling people. Um, and so for me, it's what does like an unbiased uh, search engine look like to go back to Amy's original question. I don't know because not enough people are at, the, at this table to think about what that looks like. For me, it's like, I can't even think about what the technology looks like because I'm more focused on um, putting restrictions on the things that aren't working for everyone and thinking of new ways of inviting people to a table to design what these tools, like useful tools, you know? There's a pre-conversation to what a, a, what a technology should look like. It's, who should be at the table designing it? Who is audience, you know? Yeah, that is that is a, a great point. And also what, what you brought up of that if, if the crowdsourcing is excluding so many people that in itself is a, a huge part of, of the problem. Um, I guess it looks like there's a lot of questions coming in on the chat, right, Bailey, you wanna? Wanna fire sub up? Yeah, let's go into the questions. Um, the first one came from Grace. The neoliberal solution for the lack of women and minorities in tech is generally more education and opportunities, which places the responsibility of progress on individuals rather than on institutions. Could you share thoughts on ways to truly shift power relations through social practice to celebrate multivocality and aim towards equal footing for all? Mm hmm. That's such a good question. I feel like um, it's going to require institutions to give up some things, right? Um, I hear you 100% when you say like so much of the weight of uh, change is put on the individuals who feel like they're outside of the institution. Um, that's completely unfair. And it's actually very violent to put that much work on someone who is saying I'm outside. <laughs> Um, so I, I think it requires institutions to do like a complete, uh, internal revamp of how they are, they think about engaging with their audiences, right. To really think about like their missions and are they, uh, living up to the things that they're putting on their websites. And if not to, for people to step down, right. Um, and, and, and build new power. I, I think it's as simple as that, but it's, Will people do that? I don't know. I think the real question is, what is it going to take to get people to know, uh, to realize that they need to step down so someone else can can assume power and bring in new new networks of people into the institution? Yeah, definitely. That's a great point. Um, Maria asks, how do you, speaking of institutions, how do you build relationships with museums that truly support your work and don't feel opportunistic on the part of the museum? Mm -hmm. Are there certain museums you work with because you trust the people there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good question. And I feel like something I had to learn as I was moving into my career, right? With every invitation, I feel like I um, became more clear in what I wanted out of um, a relationship or, you know, any that, that proximity to an institution. And so I feel like um, when you're invited to do a project somewhere, just like being really clear in um, who you're hoping to work with while you're there outside of that museum. Uh, I think I, I try to figure out with each invitation, like it, if, especially if it's in a different city, like who else is there that I'm excited about and how can I do this in partnership uh, with them? So thank you for the invitation, but can I do this with X, Y, and Z? <laughs> you know, and then also um, because our our work with the Opera Repository, especially, is is like so 
community specific and we're thinking about access in layered ways, you know, coming up with um, like a minimum set requirement list for you to be able to do your work excellently, you know? And so that means having cart services for us can mean having cart services available, you know? And if that's not gonna happen, then like that's part of the work, you know, all the logistical admin stuff that couch that couches the work that holds the work is also important. It's not just the aesthetic, uh, you know, decisions you make, but it's like, how do people come to see your work? That has to be set a part of your requirements, you know, for, for working with an institution. And I feel like, um, when we do that, then actually the beautiful thing is that when we leave, like we see some of that stuff become normalized, you know, like they start to consider like, oh yeah, this should be part of every program anyways. Um, and they start budgeting for that. Um, so I think to your question about like, how do you make sure things happen, happen in a meaningful way? It's that you make sure that um, you have a clear sense of like who you're trying to reach, who your audience is, and you're unyielding in that, right? Like you want, you want uh, your story to have a certain conversation and resonance with a certain community of people. So fight for not only your work, but for them too, in those partnerships. Absolutely, those are great points. Um, Sebastian asks, are your projects funded through a nonprofit or artist grants primarily? Projects are mostly financed through um, artist grants. I love, thank you Sebastian for asking that question because I love transparency. Uh, always ask people how their projects are funded. I love that. Um, yeah, most of my projects are funded either by the institution that invites us to do something or through artist grants. Um, yeah, not, there's not a nonprofit. I mean, Power Plant itself is a nonprofit, but we've done most of our uh, fundraising is all people powered. We have a membership program where people donate um, anywhere from like a dollar a month to like a hundred dollars a month, you know, like whatever is within their means. Um, all of that work is sliding scale. Um, we have some like foundation grants, but have all been really small. Um, but yes, most things are people powered or like small artist grants here and there. Awesome. Uh, Colette, she asks, I think a lot about the archival practices of Marion Stokes. Her thing was archiving broadcast television and books. Stokes was concerned with archiving significant media that would erase itself or become less available in the moment. Can you speak more on content you are compelled to rescue now? Mm -hmm. um, that's such a good question. I feel like the things that I'm compelled to, to rescue, that's such a beautiful way of asking that question. I um, am most excited about um, finding ways to archive like the, the tiny like VR experiments in our workshops, um, the, the kind of code people write in our workshops that is, you know, written all on free open source um, platforms, you know, like using processing or using Arduino, um, things that are easily downloadable, but, you know, just capturing the kind of ways that people are introduced to programming and, um, and then making their, like trying to realize their visions for a future world. Um, and I, I'm not an expert in archiving code, but, you know, I am excited by people who do that work and would love to know like if anyone on this call does this work. Um, but that, that is the kind of stuff that is exciting to me to like be able to archive the invisible, right? Like the back end of something because that is its own storytelling when someone is like has a vision for a, a world and is trying to translate it into a, another language, right? Trying to translate it into code to, to, to realize that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Beck asks, how did your tech, art, collaborative, and teaching practices prepare you for running a brick and mortar space? What skills did you find yourself needing to learn? Yeah, um, you know, for I think for me, like some of the easiest work with starting Power Plant was like the programming, like coming up with uh, potential workshops, identifying educators, like because that just meant like being watchful in my communities, right? Like going out and seeing what people were working on and learning from them, doing studio visits, attending shows, um, and just 
recognizing like the beauty and power in someone's work and inviting them to participate in our space. Um, that stuff was easy and really fun to do. I think the hard stuff was um, all the logistical stuff it takes to like run a space. Like whose job is it to make sure there's always toilet paper in the bathroom? You know, it's like that kind of admin stuff that um, is a actually a lot of work and takes up a lot of time, you know, like, uh, and that's the kind of stuff I was not prepared for. It's, again, in, in designing those kinds of like internal systems for us as a collective to manage it and hold and take care of a space. Um, so when, you know, in the case that when people ask me like, well, so our collective is thinking about becoming a nonprofit and getting the space. I'm fully supportive, but I'm also like, do you really need a space? Because here are all <laughs> the tough things that will maybe, you know, distract you from the thing that you're actually excited about. Is there someone on board who's ready to be like the operations manager and is like, okay with taking care of all of that stuff? Um, that's, that was the thing that I was not prepared for. And we're getting better every year at making sure that there's toilet paper in the bathroom, <laughs> but all sorts of things, you know? That's really good to know. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Professor Pinar Yoldis, who's gonna ask a couple more questions over the Zoom chat. Hi, Salome. Oh, wait. Hi. Hi. Is this working? Cause I, it's a different Zoom setup. Is it working? I can see yes. you. Yes. Okay. Hi, Salome. Thank you so much. This is wonderful, super exciting and fun. Uh, to, to be, you know, uh, learning more about your projects. Um, we, were, we were having a discussion before this and I was thinking about section 230. I don't know if anybody is following those conversations about how internet law is changing. Uh, section 230, actually, I just have the definition from Wikipedia in front of me. So, um, well, I'm not gonna read Wikipedia to you, but um, basically, I think it was yesterday or maybe two days ago where uh, the CEOs of Twitter, Facebook and not Instagram, what's the third one, Twitter, Facebook and one more uh, were uh, asked to, you know, go to court. And there was this discussion where actually Mark Zuckerberg's Internet failed him and he didn't show up. And it was kind of like this you know, really interesting thing. And I was just looking at the news headlines and it's these, you know, three, actually, I think one of them is ethnically different, ethnically diverse, let's call it. Uh, but these, you know, three kind of younger, whitish males, I don't know. And I was just thinking, hmm, how would it look like if these people had like different backgrounds, right? And I think at that very moment, just kind of imagining a different image and we're all artists and visual thinkers here, uh, like you're also kind of changing the, the discourse kind of like just by imagining a new version or an alternative. I just imagined, you know, I know of three Korean kids actually, how would it be if, you know, these were the CEOs? You instantly change the discourse. And I think there's something really interesting there. And I see the same uh, with your project. So I guess to sum up, uh, my question is, where do you see the role of speculative uh, for your work, right? Like speculating and just kind of imagining and envisioning other worlds and directly communicating to a larger audience. Um, is that something important for you? My second question, uh, since I don't want to take up so much time is, um, what are your thoughts on Afrofuturism? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for um, your questions. I'm also just remembering, I'm also, um, we've met before once because I am part of a collective called Refresh with Heather Dewey Hagborg. Yeah. Dorothy Santos and we hosted um, a conference last year called Refiguring the Future with Hunter College. And so you came and spoke at that conference, but for yeah. folks on the, <laughs> folks on the yeah. Line, um, yeah, I, I flew in and then flew out right back to teach here. Yeah. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, I loved your presentation. Refresh is a, a collective of uh, women and gender, gender non-conforming folks uh, working at the intersections of art, science, and technology. And that was kind of like our first um, kind of public intervention where we hosted 
uh, an exhibition at Hunter College Art Galleries and then hosted a two-day symposium. Um, and it, all the, the recordings of all of that are um, up online. I'm happy to share. Yes, it's mm -hmm. actually really well documented. It was a very mm -hmm. successful uh, conference. Um, thank you. Uh, so there are so many rich things in both of your questions. I'm thinking about, um, firstly, just diversity and representation. So like if, um, if the CEOs were people of um, other races, uh, other identity markers, right? Like, I don't know how much that would save me, right? Or save us, right? Representation is a first step, but it isn't the only step, right? And so there's something still there about holding power um, that needs to be addressed and uh, unfurled, unthreaded, right? And so uh, I would be happy to see a Black CEO or a queer trans CEO of, you know, any of these major corporations, but like they still exist <laughs> and own so much power, right? So um, yeah, there's, there's, that needs, the power needs to be addressed. That is at the root of a lot of these issues. Um, and then um, in that first question, you asked me about the role of speculative, speculative uh, speculation and imagination in my practice. So um, I, I am just have to remain an optimistic person, especially when you work in um, technology and have seen how quick some of <laughs> these developments have, um, the social implications of many of these technologies have like stepped, forcibly stepped into our lives. Um, it's easy to kind of just sit in the darkness of it all, right? Uh, but I have to remain optimistic. And so that is where uh, imagination plays a role in my practice is like, this just, this can't be it. What we have now just, it can't be it. So I, it's important for me to kind of convene thinkers across disciplines uh, to do that work, to do that speculative work of seeing what else can happen. I think as um, maybe people who are progressive, leaning, I can't remember, where did I read, read this? I think it was like um, inside philanthropy or something like that. Like, uh, but people who are more conservative, conservative leaning are wildly imaginative because they have a vision for the future that they wanna see and they are fully stepping towards that. That's what we're seeing right now, right? Like they are marching towards that vision. Whereas folks who are maybe more, more social justice leaning or progressive leaning, we're kind of forced to hold that line, right? We're kind of forced to hold their vision. Um, and it's hard for us sometimes to not just be reactive to the things they're putting forward um, and, and, and trying to keep ourselves safe. But I think the real work is in how do we step out of that, right? How do we step out of that lane of being reactive to all the violence that is coming our way, all the, all the hate, right, that is coming our way? How do we step out of that line, some of us, and do the work of imagination in the way that they are doing, right? Like, how do we how do we fully vision a world we want to see um, and collectively push forward in that vision? Um, so that that's why speculation and imagination is important to me. Is that we need to we need to see that. I also think about uh, what is it? It's uh, in the in the first chapter of the book, speculative everything, where they talk about how a younger generation doesn't. Um, no longer dreams, it hopes. Uh, Wait, they say that? It's like one of the, yeah. I, like, I have this book all the time. I totally skipped that part. I'm going to go back and find it. Find it. it it's, I think it's like in the first chapter, It they say that, yeah, a younger generation no longer dreams, it hopes. And so speculative design, right, is a way to kind of move us back into the space of dreaming, right? Um, like it's 1968. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but we just hope that things will be all right. That we just hope, right? And it's just like my the first president I was able to vote for was Barack Obama, and I always say that his campaign was built on hope. And so I'm a generation that hopes, right? But I want to get back to a, a space of of dreaming, of of just being hyper creative, you know. Um, and so that's what I, I hope to be able to do with some of my work. Um, and then Afrofuturism, 
I think I, you know, in my classes, I, um, I, I teach Afrofuturism, but I also teach it alongside many other forms of futurism. So I teach it alongside gold futurism, Chinese futurism, queer and trans futurism. I think it's important to kind of find the spaces in between futurist lenses to understand uh, a, a plurality, right, for how people are thinking about uh, and envisioning the future. That's where it's most exciting for me to be able to sit between these lenses. Uh, and I, Afrofuturism obviously has like influenced so much of how I consume media and art. I'm so excited by the aesthetic codes, the language of Afrofuturism. Um, it, you know, it's, it, it's a field that has deep theory. There's so much written about it. It's, it's older than I am, um, twice over. You know, it's, it's a beautiful um, area of inquiry. But I will say that the deeper that I've gone into working with technology, the more I've noticed people just say, call me an Afrofuturist. And uh, even with projects that have nothing to do with fu the future, <laughs> I am considered an Afrofuturist. And I, it has always just been a little bit problematic, problematic for me um, that I get tagged as such because my worry is that it's read as like a black person working with new media. It's like future and it's not, you know, like it's really, you wouldn't say that of a white artist working with technology, you know, like that they're a futurist. Um, they're working with tools that exist right here and right now, you know? Um, so that has been my issue with it. And that's um, not so much an issue with Afrofuturism, right? That's really an issue with um, criticism, right? Or it's criticism that there isn't enough language to hold people, um, all kinds of people who are working with new media and technology, right? Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, that was a really great response. Um, there's a few more questions from the chat. Curtis asks, the modern day cell phone began as a prop called a communicator in a 1960s science fiction TV show called Star Trek. What kind of resources are available to assist designs to go global? Can you repeat the end of that? What kind of what? What kind of resources are available to assist designs to go global? Mm. That's a good question. I can't think of something in particular that exists, um, but I'm like, you should build it. <laughs> Curtis, you should build it. Um, I can't think of a specific platform where people are sharing inventions. And I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot of caution around wanting to share um, inventions because like we live in, in, you know, a lot of our products are, consumer products, right? And so people want the dollar attached to that next great invention. And so there's obvious caution around wanting to share, um, yeah, your next great idea. <laughs> um, but I would love to see some kind of platform that exists where people feel um, safe to share ideas for products that should exist that would make our lives easier or better, you know? Um, yeah, I feel like a lot of that is, is held close to be proprietary. So I don't know. That's an excellent question. I feel like, Curtis, you should build it and sign me up. I think at some point there was a platform called Should Exist where people, they, I don't think they had actually invented, they hadn't built the things, but they had ideas and they said, this should exist. And I don't know if it still exists, but you said the word should exist and that reminded me. So maybe maybe there is something. But yes, Curtis should build it. Nicole asks, where do you see your craft is placed as an artist? Is it in your collaborative role as a director? That's a great question. Yeah, I see. Um, because my work is so process based, I feel like that is actually where um, I feel like the most artistic, right? Where I'm sitting uh, with groups of people, I'm making partnerships between organizations or collectives of people and figuring out um, 
how to align our language, how to align our vision, how to uh, bring us together to build or program something. Um, I, the process to me is, is more exciting than the actual final finished pieces. I feel like the final finished pieces are able to communicate what's happened on our journey to them. You know, like I use them as a way um, to talk about all the people that came together for something. Um, but it's all the invisible things that the final audience doesn't get to see is that's where I feel like my practice really sits. But I love that question. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian had another question. Who was someone who was inspirational to you growing up that helped shape your vision as a visual artist? Yeah. Um, you know, just someone very close to me. I had two uncles who were um, computer science engineers in um, Australia. You know, my family is Ethiopian, so they were able to get student visas to leave uh, Ethiopia during sort of a, a dark time politically. And um, you know, did the, the did the first gen thing of becoming either a lawyer or engineer, um, and so they did. Uh, they studied computer engineering, and they would mail me all the way to the U.S. Like when we got our first um, desktop computer as a family, they would mail me floppy disks of games they were developing in their program, and because that's how they learned um, to code they would send us floppy games, uh, floppy disks of the of their games and tell us to like break it apart, rip it apart, critique it, tell us like what works, what doesn't work. Um, and that kind of uh, back and forth process that invited conversation in art making and in, in the development of a technology, right? Uh, in storytelling was so deeply impactful that someone would let me in in their process that way. Um, and so intimately and uh would continue you know like they would take our feedback as like young people as like elementary school kids middle school kids they take it so seriously you know because we were their intended audience for these games they, they were developing and then they would continue to iterate and prototype their games so for me that exchange is like what i go back to before any you know established artists like that's what i go back to when i think about my practice and what's influenced the way i make That's so cool. Uh, uh, one last question from the chat. Laura asks, how has the pandemic individuals and communities? It cut out just for a second, Bailey. Sorry, I think my internet's struggling a little bit. How has the pandemic affected how you engaged with individuals and communities? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, with Power Plant, I've had to, uh, we've had to rethink all of our program, because again, we have a physical space and people are no longer able to convene in physical space. Um, so what we did was we sought this as a, um, an opportunity to make a, a, build a coalition of mission aligned organizations and small artist collectives um, outside of New York City, which we were never able to really do because we were so space uh, place based, right? And so uh, we built a kind of small network of orgs uh, organizations and collectives and um, are in constant communication. We just launched our first program as a cohort last weekend, uh, hosted by um, a young emerging artist, Olivia Michaela Ross, who goes by Cyber Doula on Instagram. Um, you should follow her. Uh, so many, so many gems from Cyber Doula. Um, but as a group, we hosted a two-day workshop series for teens. Um, on creative coding principles, um, introduced some like fundamentals to thinking about the social, social layers of technology. Um, and it was successful. And so now we wanna continue to think about, you know, this is will be going on for who knows how long, at least we're thinking at least a year, you know? And so now we've built these relationships across the country. We wanna expand this coalition and, um, continue to do this kind of online programming um, for folks who are on the line and have an interest in teaching, please reach out to me uh, or Power Plant. We're always trying to uh, 
trying to partner with people to do this kind of online programming. So if you're, you have an interest, I feel like this is like a low level way to kind of um, get introduced to online teaching, online workshops. Um, we're happy to kind of do that, that learning with you as well. I'm also seeing just even as an artist, I'm seeing um, organizations start to develop new streams for engaging artists, right? So starting to figure out how to do digital commissions, how they're, you know, we're seeing organizations, museums figure out how to do digital exhibitions. And so um, for artists who work at this intersection or work with new media, you're kind of primed for this already, right? And so I feel like in, um, you know, these organizations transition to digital, we're kind of like the perfect guinea pigs because we already have the files handy for things like this. And so, um, so yeah, so it's been just a lot of initial experiments with um, spaces who are transitioning to, digi to, to gi digital, excuse me. We had one more question in the chat. Um, is your practice embedded in capitalism? Does your vision include dismantling capitalism? Yeah, deep question. Um, I feel like our practice is mostly working through an abolition framework, um, thinking about, uh, there's a reason why we ask people to come together to, to rethink things, right? Like obviously things aren't working. So doesn't that include capitalism? I feel like in fact, um, capitalism gets brought up in every workshop and we uh, are thinking about designing future products, um, which we also try to find a, a new word for products that always comes up in our workshops, but finding, uh, we're, we've been brought together to rethink the future in ways that serve us better, um, serve black people better specifically, because that's who our workshop, um, who, are, who our workshop serves, right? And so um, capitalism doesn't work for us, so no. <laughs> but it is the reality of in which, in which we, we live, right? So uh, there, are, there are some ideas, artifacts, and missions that we get that are about scamming the system. It's like how to make it work for you better in the meantime, which is like a, something we've learned from groups like Bufu or Yellow Jackets Collective, right? It's like how do you scam the institution in the meantime while working or driving towards um, uh, abolishing capitalism or, you know, in, in your anti-capitalist vision. And so, um, short answer, no, it doesn't work for us. So it's not part of it. <laughs> uh, now I'd love to open it back up to Amy or Pinar for closing questions or thoughts. Wow, I, I I don't think I can add anything to to that. That was I think such a good uh, uh, that was such a good close. Uh, Pinar, do you want to? Uh, all I want to say is thank you, Salom. There is one more question mm -hmm. here. Oh. From, from oh no, is it an old question? Never mind. I think I'm wrong. Never mind. Just thank you, thank you so much, Salom, for this wonderful yeah, our... talk and this energy. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Salome. That was just, yeah, that, I, you handled so many different topics. That was just amazing. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a treat. And I, it's like, um, I was saying this before, I think we went live, but I really enjoy visiting other programs and visiting other schools. And um, the hardest part of doing like a Zoom lecture is not being able to see all of your faces and um, just really feel your energy and see like what is most exciting to you. So thank you for throwing questions into the chat. And um, I am so, like easily accessible online. So if anything, you wanna talk about anything further, like please hit me up whatever way makes the most sense to you. Um, but this was, yeah, I wanna continue having a conversation with you all. This was really nice, thank you. I think that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today, Salome. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, I'd just like to thank Paolo for helping us with the technical stuff, Danielle for doing the introduction. Thank you, Amy and Pinar for joining me in moderating the Q&A. And thanks to Amy Adler and the Visual Arts Department for hosting this lecture series. Thank you so much, Salome. <laughs>